Okay, testing, can people at the back hear me okay? Okay, very good. Um, I'm very happy to be here of my first Tassie, so thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me. I'm here to continue the two weeks of dark matter lectures that I <laughs> heard about the discussion, uh, the discussion of t-shirt titles last night. So I've been asked to give you three lectures about dark matter indirect detection. which can be schematically described, as you've probably seen a few times before, by this diagram in this form. Dark matter particles stand in, come in, standard model particles go out. You can also have situations where one dark matter particle comes in, two standard model particles come out, or other variations. Three dark matter particles come in, two dark matter particles go out. Etc. So what I want to do in so what I want to the way that I've decided to split up these lectures, indirect detection is a pretty huge area with a large diversity of searches and of possible signatures. So what I'm going to try to do is in today's lecture sort of focus on this side of the equation and how fundamental questions about the properties of dark matter lead in to indirect detection phenomenology. I'll try to talk a bit about the two most common signals considered, annihilation and decay, and what their general parametrics are. What sort of regime we need to be in to see something potentially detectable, and what we expect from particle physics. And then, as much as time permits at the end, I want to try to talk a bit about exceptions to the standard law, cases where the sort of standard picture that I tell you about in this part break down, and what effects that can have. Then, in the second, this is lecture one, in lecture two, I really want to focus on these observable consequences and how we actually look for the standard model particles that might be produced by dark matter interactions, how we do these searches, what the important quantities are, what the uncertainties are, what we need to understand to model these signals. And then my third lecture will be not a chalk talk based on slides, it will be the last lecture of the week and I will show you lots of pretty pictures of current constraints and um, hints of excesses in indirect detection. Please, if you have questions at any point, Raise your hand if there's, um, if there's anything that I've said that isn't clear, anything you'd like further explanation on, ask questions as I go. Okay, so, so let's begin. So indirect detection, generally, I'm going to define it as the search for standard model particles produced by interactions of dark matter with itself or with standard model particles from dark matter out in the cosmos. So this can cover dark matter annihilation, dark matter decay, can cover dark matter scattering processes. The advantages so the, the strengths of indirect detection as a search are that there is a huge amount of DM out there in the cosmos. It's 80% of the matter in the universe, it's 20% of the energy density of the universe. So a huge, there is a huge energy density and ambient DM, just say essentially DM is. The advantages, there's a huge energy density in ambient DM. We have sensitive multi-purpose telescopes that as well as looking for astrophysical, obs for astrophysical observables can probe these kinds of signatures almost by accident. And these cover a huge frequency range, as we'll talk about tomorrow.
This is helpful when talking to funding agencies. Your dark matter search is also naturally a pulsar search or a search for interesting things happening in radio. The difficulties, as we'll see, especially on Friday, is that these interactions are small. The rates tend to be small, and the backgrounds tend to be large and not particularly controllable. So given these constraints, what can we say about indirect detection? What kinds of questions can we answer with indirect detection that we would not be able to answer using other channels? Well, one question that really our only hope for answering it empirically is the question, so some sort of fundamental questions about dark matter is, is dark matter actually absolutely stable? You will never learn the answer to this question at the LHC. Dark matter is certainly stable on the time scale it takes for a particle to get out of the LHC. You will not learn it directly from direct detection. We know that just for the dark matter to be around in the present day, we know that if it decays, its lifetime much be, must be much longer than the age of the universe. But because such a large fraction of the energy density of the universe is in dark matter, even a, um, e even a very tiny decay rate with a lifetime much longer than the age of the universe can potentially give rise to observable consequences. So just taking a particle physics perspective on this for the moment, there are models where dark matter is absolutely stable. In many models, you impose some symmetry or parity that keeps the DM stable. The classical example of this is our parity in SUSY. I know you've had several SUSY lectures, so I won't belabor this point, but essentially in this simple example of our parity in SUSY, you say, well, okay, all the superpartners have our parity minus one. Standard particles have, um, standard model particles have our parity one. This implies that you cannot have a decay of the form you have a particle with R minus one, which decays into two particles, which both have R plus one. And so this means that the decays of the lightest supersymmetric particle, the lightest R parity odd particle, cannot occur and it's stable because it can't decay to anything that has our parity odd on this side just by kinematics. So but it can't decay purely into lighter standard model particles because of our parity. So in many models of dark matter, there's something like this, and you just say, okay, we don't expect any decay signal. But it's also true that as a general rule, just because you have a symmetry in a low energy theory, that doesn't mean that it's actually a perfect symmetry of your theory. It can be broken by operators at a high scale. Just. So we can ask, okay, if we did have some high energy effective operator that was breaking a symmetry that keeps dark matter stable, what kind of decay rates would that give us? So let's, just as a sort of, ju just as a sort of example, let's suppose that it was gut scale physics that was breaking our symmetry and causing our dark matter decay.
what kind of rate would we expect for the decay in that case? So this is the same kind of exercise that you can do for proton decay. You can say, OK, I've got some general operator at the gut scale. What kind of prediction would I have for the decay rate? So let's, OK, start out. Just classify the operators by dimension. Suppose we had a DIM5 operator to begin with. Now, OK, we know that our time scale, so our amplitude, is going to have like a 1 on 1 divided by the high scale in it. Our, our um, amplitude squared is going to have 1 over the high scale squared. So this t the only other math scale in the problem is the mass of the dark matter. So a reasonable guess for this time scale would be that it's going to be like the uh, gut scale squared divided by the dark matter mass cubed. Okay, This is just dimensional analysis combined with the dimension 5 operator. So let's suppose for, I know you've all heard the Thomorelic story a couple of times. Let's suppose we had order TV scale dark matter about the region that the LHC is currently beginning to probe. Then, so for TV dm, this would give us 2 times 10 to the 16 GV squared over 10 to the 3 GV cubed. So we can, um, it's a useful, so we can do a unit conversion here. 1 inverse GV is about 6 times 10 to the minus 25 seconds, Google tells me. So. Google is good at unit conversions. It's, uh, it's, it's a handy tool. So, OK, so this is telling us, so this is giving us about 10 to the 32 divided by 10 to the 9. So that's 10 to the 23 inverse GV. So, um, so when we put this in, we're going to get a number which is about one second. That's bad. <laughs> OK? We don't want the dark matter to decay with a time scale of one second. That is, um, that is very observationally falsified. OK, so we'd better not have any dimension 5 gut scale operators that violate this symmetry. What about DIM6? Well, no, so, so now, same argument, except now we're going to get two extra powers of M gut from, um, from the amplitude. So our dimensional estimate for the lifetime is going to be something like this. Again, let's consider it for TVDM. Put in, put in our numbers again. Now we've got 10 to the 64 in the numerator. 10 to the 15 in the denominator, some extra pieces from this factor of 2. So this is going to be about 10 to the 50 inverse GV, or about 10 to the 26 seconds. So that's, um, that's pretty good. Does anyone know the lifetime of the universe in seconds? Yeah, good. Yeah, so T universe is there's a, about 10 to the 10 years. Which is so one year is to a pretty good approximation pi times ten to the seven seconds. It's um it's three point one four times ten to the seven, so to all intents and purposes this is pi. So okay. So pi times ten to the seventeen seconds is the age of our universe. So this is fine. This is something that would be totally acceptable for, for a dark matter candidate. Let's do our first, or maybe first first in my lecture, indirect detection calculation and see whether we could actually expect to observe this kind of decay rate. OK, so to do this kind of, so now our question is, could we see this? If dark matter was decaying into standard model particles with a lifetime of this order, would it be visible? So what do we need to know to work this out? So, I mean, part of this is, depends on, OK, where do you look and what kind of particle do you produce? Let's ignore these subtleties for the moment, and let's just ask, like, are there enough particles 
from this decay passing through our local volume to, um, to say something interesting. So let's, um, so first, first pass, let's suppose say that you're producing electrons and positrons with this decay. So consider electrons and positrons, they're, at these energies, their propagation distance in our galaxy is about one kiloparsec. That's convenient, that's about, so that, that's a region in which we can expect the dark matter density doesn't change so much. So let's consider decays within one kpc of Earth. We want to know, okay, how many particles would a detector at Earth see from this process? So the local dark matter density, we'll just assume that the local dark matter density in this sphere is comparable to what it is at Earth. Okay, it's not a very large distance by galactic standards. You've all just had the direct detection lectures. Someone tell me roughly what the dark matter density at Earth is. Say again? 0.3, okay, good. I use 0.4 usually, but fine. 0.3, we can use 0.3. Okay, so the first, so we need to, so we need to know, okay, so let's, um, so the rate of decays within this volume, okay, so this is, so this is our dark matter density. Our number density, so the number of dark matter particles per unit volume is going to be the mass density divided by the dark matter mass. So just leave that free. So we'll just leave that free for a moment. Now, suppose we ask what's the probability that a given dark, like how many particles are we going to produce by dark matter decay per unit time? So we know that um, after a time t e to the minus t over tau dm particles have not decays. So the rate of decays per unit time is just going to be obtained by differentiating this rate of change of dark matter particles per unit time. If we're in the limit that this tau is very, very large compared to all the times we're interested in, which is true if that's the kind of lifetime that we're talking about, then we can ignore the exponential and we can just say, okay, the rate of um, the rate of losses or the rate of decays is just one over the time scale. Okay, so now let's say, okay, suppose there's some volume element. Let's consider the contribution to the particles observed at Earth from some volume element at distance r away from us. And then we're going to integrate this distance r out to one, out to one kiloparsec. So we know that the so decays per unit volume per unit time is going to be given by the number density of particles in that volume. So that's NDM times the rate of decays for an individual particle, which is 1 over tau. So we have 0.3 GV divided by M chi times 1 over time per cubic centimeter. Now, in this volume element, so then in this volume element dV, the decays per unit time are going to be this dV. We can say We'll just assume you know, everything's isotropic here, no changes in density. So we'll write this dV as just 4 pi 
r squared dr. Okay, so this is the so these are the particles produced in a shell at a, at a, of a width dr, a distance r away from us. But for every so this is the decays per unit time in that shell. But the decays that we see in that shell, or so and let's assume okay, each of these decays makes two standard makes two standard model particles. So the particles we see per unit time from this shell is going to be, well, if our detector is a variant A, every, in every one of these events, the particles will stream out isotropically in all directions. The fraction of them that we will see is going to be the area of our detector over the area of the sphere at a distance r from the original point. So this is the fraction of products we see. So then we're going to multiply that by the actual number of decays per unit time and the number of particles per decay, which I'll just call 2. OK. But now, so the fact that there are more, there's more volume at a greater distance r from us is going to be cancelled out by the fact that we see a smaller fraction of the particles from those more distant events. So we're just going to get this. The contribution from a given shell is just going to be this constant times dr. So now if we integrate from r equals 0 to 1 kpc, then we're going to see dn by dt is going to be of order area okay so let's just check this is dimensionless so 0.6 gv this is dimensionless this has units of area this has units of distance that'll cancel out these volume units here this will just give us a rate per unit per unit time so if we put in the numbers for this, you have to know the conversion factor from um, kiloparsecs to centimeters, which I don't expect you to memorize. But a kiloparsec is of order 3,000 light years, if you need an order of magnitude estimate. Why one KP, uh, why, why one KPC? Yeah, so, so this was pretty arbitrary. I could have picked a larger volume to look at. I'm picking one KPC here. That's what would be appropriate if I was looking for order tens or 100 GeV electrons or positrons from this reaction, because that's about the propagation distance for those particles in our galaxy. If I was looking for, um, yeah, if I was looking for photons or neutrinos, uh, gamma rays or neutrinos, I can integrate over a much larger volume. Okay, so this is just a, this is this is a this is a first pass. However, if I'm looking at a much larger volume, I am going to need start needing to take into account the fact that the dark matter density is not uniform <laughs> on large scales. Okay, but within one kpc, the density is pretty similar to what it is at the Earth. Yeah. In terms of searches, like, like typical distances of things you'd be looking at, like, like can you pick, can you mean like an example of a, I don't know a galaxy that, that that's one kpc away or something? Or okay, a... right. So sc scales here. Let's do um let's do a little bit of. Uh, Let's do a little bit of astrophysics. So, we're, so our Milky Way is a spiral galaxy. This is the galactic center here. Earth is here. We sit in the plane. The distance between us and the galactic center is about 8.5 kiloparsecs, about 25,000 light years. Okay, so this is a galactic scale. We'll talk about this a bit more in the next lecture. We'll actually talk about deriving some of this. 
But the propagation distance for charged particles, for electron and, po and in particular for light charged particles, for electron and positron cosmic rays, is about 1 kpc. If you're talking about weak scale electrons and positrons. Within that distance, they lose their energy. The dwarf, now the actual, the dark matter halo of the Milky Way, this is drawn too small, but the dark matter halo of the Milky Way reaches the virial radius about 200, at about 200 kpc. Within this halo, there are small, there are dwarf galaxies, dwarf satellites of the Milky Way. The closest of these that we know about, so yeah, so all the distances in the disk are exaggerated relative to the distances in the halo. The halo is much big, is not drawn to scale. This diagram, this is about 200 kpc. The closest dwarf galaxies to us are about 30 kpc away. The further ones are much more distant. Um, once you start, yeah, so if you're talking about looking at other galaxies or about, um, then you're talking about in order hundreds of kpc distances at least, or megaparsecs. Like, like what's the most likely object or emitter? Yeah, so, so that, right, so, so, the, so the estimate that I'm doing here is just from dark matter decaying in the region around the Earth, producing cosmic rays that we would measure at the Earth, how many, um, how many particles would you expect to see you from it? At the moment, this is not a particular target. This is, yeah. So what, so the, so yeah, this is just sort of a first pass to see around how many particles would you produce. But the direct search that it's relevant to is, um, co is cosmic ray, is cosmic ray searches in the neighborhood of the Earth. Because you're not going to see, you're not going to see at least weak scale cosmic rays coming from a distant galaxy. They don't travel far enough. Okay. 200 kpc is about the virial is is about the virial radius of the Milky Way. So it's um it's the point at which the dark matter. So at our location, this is another useful piece of information. No. At our location, the um the dark matter local density you've said is about 0.3 GV per cubic centimeter. Cosmologically, it's about 10 to the minus 6 GV per cubic centimeter. So we have an overdensity of about five orders of magnitude in our in our local halo at the virial radius. Um, it's about, the overdensity is about a factor of 200. Okay. So, right, no good, you're, you're anticipating stuff that I will get to later in these lectures. Yeah, if you're just talking about our galaxy, just talking about these 1 kpc differences, distances, or a few tens of kpc distances, the expansion of the universe is not very significant. The, the time scale that it took for light, I mean, again, you're, we're thinking in light years, right? A KPC is about 3,000 light years. You're talking about a few hundreds of thousands of light years. How much has the universe expanded in 100,000 years? Not, not very much, right? So the red, shifting, the red shifting is a small effect here. But once you start looking at clusters in particular, you really do need to take into account the, you really do need to take into account the red shifting. And then you have to be a bit more careful about the intervals that I'm doing here, where I just say, oh yeah, the distance is one over, the distance is R, it spreads out over a volume of four pi R squared. These are flat space formulae. They, it gets a little bit more complicated once you start talking about red shifting. But we'll talk about how to do that next lecture. Okay. So we take these numbers, we plug them in, we put in, if we put in tau of 10 to the 26 seconds, we convert one kiloparsec to centimeters here, then what you find is that if you have, and you can do this yourself if you like, if you were to take so like a TV dark matter particle at a K time of 10 to the 26 seconds, an area of, we'll say about a square meter, because that's something that we can eat, build or put into space. And then our rate from this estimate comes out at something like 10 to the minus 4 events per second. So this is of order 1,000 events per year. Okay. So, so what can you take? So what can you take? I, again, I encourage you to type into Google or your favorite unit converter these numbers, put them into that result, see what you get out. So the advantage here is that one kpc is a huge number. We have a huge volume to integrate over here. We have 
a significant density of dark matter in that whole volume. So even though this rate is very small, this lifetime is extremely large, we could still expect to see an order thousand number of events per year in an experiment on, on a well, order of a thousand events in a terrestrial sort of time scale, a year or so, as you know, within the range of a PhD thesis, and, um, and, with, and with experiments of reasonable effective area. Now, in practice, we can, do much, we can do much better than this if we're not trying to put the experiment in space. We have experiments that have the high energy gamma ray telescopes, the ground based gamma ray telescopes have effective areas about five orders of magnitude larger than this. Um, the downside is that they usually, they can only stare at one particular point on the sky. They can't, can't take in particles coming from all directions. And so for any given target, they can only, they usually can't look at it for a year. But um, again, tomorrow we'll talk a bit more about the details of the various experiments. But this does at least give you, uh, as, as a first quick estimate, that there are time scales where we sh are much longer than the age of the universe that could potentially give us insight into physics that's happening up at the gut scale. And those kinds of time scales are very observable in present day, ex in present day experiments. As you'll see when I show you the constraints later on, the typical time scales constrained by present day searches, depending on the mass of the dark matter and the channel that you're looking in, vary from about 10 to the 25 seconds to 10 to the 28 seconds. So that's sort of the, okay. Now, this is not, this kind of new operator at the gut scale is of course not the only interesting way to get decay lifetimes. There's, you've already probably heard a little bit about the 3.5 kV line and the idea of sterile neutrino dark matter. So another example is where the high scale doesn't, isn't just from a high scale operator like this, but, but where there is very small mixing. So another example of this kind of long lifetime decay is sterile neutrino decay. In that case, the idea is that you have a sterile neutrino which mixes into a much lighter neutrino and then can decay into a lighter neutrino and a photon by processes like this. It can also potentially decay into just two lighter neutrinos if you don't require the electromagnetic piece. So like, this is one of the diagrams that would contribute to sterile neutrino decay. Here, the parameter that gives you a very long lifetime is the fact that the mixing between the sterile neutrino and the active neutrinos can be extremely small. So the lifetime that you get for processes like this took from one of Kev Abizagian's papers has this kind of behavior. So for the, so for the, um, so here MS is the mass of the sterile neutrino, theta is this mixing angle. You can see that these time scales are normalized to 10 to the minus 10 mixing angles for, well, for sine, squared theta, sine squared two theta. So the range of interest for the, the range of interest for dark matter sterile neutrinos gives you a lifetime which is a few orders of magnitude smaller than this 10 to the 32 seconds. It's around 10 to the 28 seconds. Again, that is a range which is potentially detectable. We'll talk more about that when I talk about the 3.5 kV line. Yeah, that's, M that's MS. Yeah, yeah, MS here is the mass of the sterile one. It's the mass of your dark matter candidate. Okay, so that's one. So that's one big question: Is dark matter absolutely stable? How would we know whether it was or not? What would so this at least gives us some hope that that kind of question may be experimentally accessible? The other question, the one that I've been told you've already heard discussed a couple of times, is. 
why does dark matter have the observed abundance? Oh, okay, just, uh, my, my, say, my point was just that, yeah, um, again, I'll talk a bit more about this when I talk about the 3.5 kV line. Point about sterile neutrinos is that just that, I mean, I gave the example of some gut scale symmetry breaking being what generates a long lifetime. You can, of course, also get comparable lifetimes where you just happen to have an extremely small mixing in, in your theory. Sterile neutrino dark matter is a pretty, um, is a, is a pretty active, Field and but it's so what the way the sterile neutrino dark matter works is this coupling determines both the population of the sterile neutrinos in the early universe and thus how much abundance they have and then it and then it also describes their decay lifetime. This is the diagram that gives you decays. If you pin this coupling to what you need to get the right abundance in the universe, there's a fair bit of hand waving there because it depends whether your production is resonant or non-resonant. But but if you pin it around this level, then for KV sterile neutrinos, this is around the kind of lifetime that you naturally expect. Yeah, so, but it has a power to the five dependence on the mass of the sterile neutrino. So um, if I take seven KV, if I take, you know, seven, if I take three and a half K, if I take seven KV sterile neutrinos, which decay and make 3.5 KV photon lines, then you see that this actually brings the lifetime back down into the range that we just argued was in the ballpark of being experimentally testable. So the head has to be like super small, like 10 to the minus 5. Sorry? Yeah. Head. Yeah. And why is that? Like you, you just tune in? So you, yeah, um, the question of, like, yeah. Right, so the question is, um, so the question is, is there a, I just realized I've been bad about repeating questions back to people, I'll try to remember to do that. Yeah, so the question is, what is the, like, what is the natural size of the mixing between sterile neutrinos and active neutrinos? Is there a good reason that it should be so small? Um, it's model dependent. It, I mean, it, it depends how you set up your model. I can give you some, I, I can give you some references and some examples. Generated. I don't want to go into detail. Okay, so that sort of motivates, you know, why, what kind of dark matter decay rates are potentially experimentally accessible to us, and, you know, why we might think that there's some reason that we might have interesting dark matter decay rates in this region. So let's ask, but let's now ask a different question, which is why does dark matter have, it's observed. abundance. And this is the usual sort of motivation for arguments about the other kind of indirect detection process that is frequently looked for in the searches are frequently parameterized in terms of, which is annihilation. So one answer So, so, so one, so one answer is that the dark matter annihilates away, and um, and that gives you the observed amount of time. So let's just talk about annihilation for a sec. So whereas decay, we argued, decay has to be a very has to be very small for dark matter to be dark matter, it means there generally needs to be some kind of symmetry or property of the theory that prevents the dark matter from decaying away on time scales analogous to other unstable particles, but for annihilation, it's not typically forbidden by whatever symmetry keeps the dark matter sta stable. I mean, if we, I mean, again, taking the example of our parity, We can certainly have two dark matter particles, both with our parity odd, and produce two standard, two standard, lighter standard model particles, each 
with our parity even. Both the initial final and states have overall even our parity. So this isn't a problem. We don't expect any natural suppression to the annihilation rate from, um, ju just from dark matter being dark matter. Now, again, now if we, have, if we have a process like this, we said for decays, the rate was just going to scale, the rate of decays is just going to scale like the number density of dark matter divided by the lifetime for decays. For annihilations, for such processes, the rate so this is the rate per unit volume, I guess. For annihilations, the rate of annihilations per volume is going to scale like the dark matter density squared, because it's a two-body process, times the, um, times the cross-section, times the typical velocity of the dark matter particles, and then if, then if the dark matter particles are identical, there's a, fact, there's a factor of two here. The reason for this is the reason for this is, is I mean, what, one, way, one other way to say this is OK, for each dark matter particle, its chance of annihilating on another DM particle. So if I pick one, digit, one individual DM particle, the rate of annihilations from the flux of dark matter particles striking that particle is going to be the cross section times the flux. V rel, yes, V um, relative to each other, yeah. not, not relativistic, yeah, the relative velocity of the two particles, yes. Yeah, so right, if I'm, so this is, yeah, so if I'm going to average this over a large number of dark matter particles, sigma can in principle have some velocity dependence, some relative velocity dependence, going to put these numbers around it. If I have a given dark matter particle and I ask what is the rate of particle collisions with it, it's going to be the cross section times the flux of dark matter particles incident on it. That's the number of density times the, the relative velocity. But then I want to multiply by the number of dark matter particles in my volume. So that gives me this other factor of NDM. And then I need to include this factor of two because otherwise I'll be double counting annihilations. I'll be counting twice the annihilation where particle B runs into particle A and particle A runs into particle B. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so if I want to ask what is the probability that a given dark matter particle annihilates over time, then I want to look at this expression. If I want to ask what is the total rate of dark matter annihilations in a given volume, over time, I want to look at this quantity. So again, we can do this exercise and ask, would this be observable? But now we need, again, we'd like an estimate for what's a reasonable kind of annihilation rate to look for. And um, we now don't. I mean, we, we could do what we did for decay, but in this case, we actually have a, an even cleaner argument. I was at one point going to take you through the whole thermorelic calculation again, but then someone told me you have seen that already, perhaps a couple of times at this TASI. So let me just summarize the argument. So if we want to answer that question, why does dark matter have its observed abundance? The thermorelic scenario
says that the dark matter and the standard model were once in thermal equilibrium. And they were kept that way by two to two processes. So processes that form two dark matter particles collide, produce two standard model particles, or vice versa. Then when the temperature dropped below The dark matter mass, the abundance of dark matter was exponentially suppressed by Boltzmann suppression. So annihilation is depleted. So the abundance of dark matter was exponentially suppressed until eventually the rate for annihilation this rate for any dark matter particle to collide and annihilate with a given dark matter particle became comparable to the expansion time scale. So when the time scale for annihilation became comparable to the expansion time scale, the DM could moving density approached a constant value which up to log up to log dependencies on the mass was ju is just proportional to 1 over the averaged annihilation cross section weighted by b okay so this exponential depletion continued until this condition was met then it froze out and the key things that you need to know, that you need to recall from that calculation, uh, are they're really just two numbers. One is the therm is the cross section that you need to get the observed present day abundance. So, to recover the correct. Abundance, the cross section, this average cross section sigma v needs to be about 2 to the 3 times 10 to the minus 26 centimeters cubed per second. And the temperature at freeze out needs to be about 1 20th of the dark matter mass. Do people remember this? Because if, I mean, I was told, okay, good. I, I see nodding heads, good, okay. I was told you'd done this before, I, um, so I didn't want to drag you through it all again. But, and just to, and just as a reminder for where this comes from, this essentially just comes about from solving the Boltzmann equation, which says that the number of dark matter particles has uh, it's diluted by the expansion of the universe, which is what this term represents. And then it's diluted by annihilations and repopulated in equilibrium by collisions of standard model particles. Okay, so now let's do, let's just do again another quick estimate, similar to what we did for decay. If we take this cross section and we ask, all right, again, just thinking about dark matter annihilating within our local neighborhood, just for the dark matter just around us. Again, we'll sit, think about cosmic rays. So think about a volume of about one kiloparsec around us. How many particles could we potentially see from such a signal? Well, we've just written down the rate per unit time.
Ja. Ah. Oh, the two. Um. In this case, in general, each decay will produce two standard model particles. But since I'm only doing order of magnitude estimates, that two is really completely irrelevant for the purposes of this calculation. Like, there are many other factor of two uncertainties here. But, um, OK. But clear? But in principle, I mean, it could, that number could be important if you had a decay that went through some, you know, for example, in general, it's not just two, because in general, you may produce unstable standard model particles which, which decay, producing a lot of lower energy particles. Like if I produce uh, some quarks, then in general, they're going to hadronize, they're going to produce neutral pions, those pions will decay, producing gamma rays, so I may get significantly more than two particles out of a given annihilation or decay, uh, they'll just be lower energy than initial than uh, than the dark matter itself. The um, for making kV photons or oh like right so um you mean like from heavy neutrinos decaying into. Yeah, so there's not much of a, well, OK, so the, I mean, there's not the abundance of the abundance of dark matter is quite a lot higher than the abundance of neutrinos out, out, in, out in space. I mean, in principle, neutrino interactions can I mean, neutrinos are dark matter. They're just hot dark matter. I mean, in principle, neutrino interactions could also, I suppose, give rise to indirect detection signals. But since they're a very small fraction of the dark matter as a whole, I think th those signals are a fair bit lower than what we would expect if dark matter is a wimp. I guess eventually indirect detection will, may hit its own neutrino flaw, <laughs> just, like, just like direct detection. But I mean, also, of course, neutrinos are very low energy. The particles that you're looking for, if you're looking for, well, I mean, if you're looking for if you're looking for kV scale sterile neutrinos, you're going to see annihilation or decay products coming out at the kV scale. If you're looking at WIMPs, you're looking for particles coming out at the TV scale. For the moment, I'm just talking about numbers of particles, but in reality, we have spectral information as well. And there's not much of a background from standard model processes for... There are standard model processes that produce TV, that, that produce gamma rays and neutrinos at all of these energies. Um, for lions, there's not much of there's there are backgrounds, but um, not much at that precise. Well, not many at the dark matter mass, presumably. Are the backgrounds mostly the stars in, in emitting radiation, or is there some sort of you know, like No, yeah. So, so the the backgrounds the backgrounds. If you're looking for um, anything in gamma rays, the backgrounds are all baryonic. Um, the, they're I'll talk about it more in the in the second lecture. <laughs> Again, I realize I've said this a few times, but they come from high energy for gamma rays, for example. They come from high energy gamma, uh, cosmic rays interacting with the gas or with starlight. So we actually need to understand how to handle cosmic rays, both for signals and for background. Okay. So then, again, okay. So again, we'll just quickly do this estimate of what the likely rate can be. OK, we know the rate per volume is the dark matter density squared times sigma VRL divided by 2. So again, if we want to know how many particles per unit time are incident on our detector from this, from this sphere, it's potentially we're going to integrate from one kiloparsec out to zero, our volume element, which is 4 pi r squared dr. We're going to say the fraction of particles that we see from the annihilation is the detector area divided by 4 pi r squared. And then we're going to multiply by our annihilation rate per unit volume, per unit time. So this gives us dark matter density squared, dark matter mass density squared divided by the dark matter mass squared times the area of our detector. And sure, and I'll put in a number for n particles 
for annihilation. So I'll have a sigma b over 2 times 1 kpc times however many particles I had per annihilation. Again, if I plug in the numbers here, if I say rho dm is about 0.4 GV per cubic centimeter, I'll let this be 10 to the 3 GV. I put in one kiloparsec, I put in an area of about one meter squared, then then this thermal relic cross-section would give me an estimate of about one event per year. So this is a, fair, so this is a bit more pessimistic than what we just had. Thermal relic dark matter at the TeV scale is actually quite hard to see. We do have this 1 over m chi squared factor, so if we were talking about 100 GeV dark matter instead, we'd, be, we'd have a signal that was 100, time, that was 100 times larger. Can I increase? Sorry? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so is it easier to see if I have more particles per... Okay, so the question was, yeah, I've got this factor in here for n to get this number. I did say n was equal to 1. What if, what if I produce lots and lots of particles per annihilation? Um, yeah, so in principle, that will make it easier to actually see them. The problem you tend to run into there is that the more particles you have per annihilation, the lower in energy they are, and the lower in energy you go, the higher your backgrounds are. But yeah, it, that can help with, do you have a signal at all? Uh, it, but it tends to screw you over on signal versus background. But okay, but this at least tells us, all right, for weak scale dark matter around the thermal, and this was for thermal relic cross sections, we are not diff, we are not terribly far away from being able to measure these sorts of signals with with present with terrestrial scale detectors and on time scales that are interesting to people who need to write PhD theses. So this is really, I mean, these sorts of arguments are the motivation behind a lot of direct detection. There are interesting parts of parameter space for cross sections for annihilation and for lifetimes for decay for which they're very, they're potentially very observable in the present day. Now, and, and the kinds of calculations that we've just done are really how most, more or less how most indirect detection calculations work. You know, all right, I have some, I have some particle physics that tells me how many particles I should have per annihilation and what energy spectra they should have. I have some estimate for the dark matter density over the region that we're looking at. Just estimate, all right, what signal should I see of my detectors? And then the difficult part is disentangling that from backgrounds. But um, these calculations are, we'll do more examples next time, but they're generally not particularly difficult to do. Okay, so now I wanna just continue talking about annihilation for a bit more. So this was an estimate, could we see it with present day? Could we see it with present day telescopes? Could we see, like just look at the impact from dark matter annihilation in a little bubble around us? Next time we'll talk much more about other targets for these present day telescopes. But just from these simple parametrics of thermorelic annihilation, you can also ask the question, well, what would this do to the rest of the history of the universe? if we had dark matter annihilation continually occurring at this rate throughout the history of our cosmos. We know it's observable today, but... So, okay, so the first sort of calibration here. We know that after freeze-out, dark matter annihilation does not significantly affect the abundance of dark matter in the universe. That's what freeze out means, okay? At the time of freeze out, on average, a dark matter particle will annihilate about once per Hubble time. That's what we mean when we say the annihilation time scale and the Hubble and the expansion time scale are similar. At all subsequent times, the Hubble time scale exceeds, Hubble time scale becomes shorter than the annihilation time scale. But as we've just seen, that doesn't mean that annihilation is 
switches off altogether. So there's a simple question that you can ask, which is just how does the cosmological deammonihilation scale with time? So, okay, if I want to ask, let's use as our quantity, I want to know how many annihilations are there in a given co-moving volume. in a Hubble time. Well, our rate of annihilations per unit volume per unit time is n squared sigma v over 2, right? Our size of our co-moving volume is going to scale like it's going to scale like a cubed where a is the scale factor. Okay? And a Hubble time and okay, and our Hubble time is h to the minus one. Okay. So n here, so let's and let's consider the universe now the early universe before structure formation. So the dark matter density is going to be proportional to a to the minus three, because it's just called dark matter. Then we have two, well possibly three parameters for parameterizations for h we have in we have radiation we have the epoch of radiation domination we have the epoch of matter domination and we have the very short towards the end epoch of dark energy domination so in radiation domination h squared is proportional to rho which is proportional to a to the minus 4 Okay, so h scales like a to the minus 2. The same argument in matter domination, h scales like a to the minus 1.5. And in dark energy domination, h um, scales, uh, am I doing this right? And during dark energy domination, uh, h is just constant. Okay, people, can, is it legible? People at the back, you see what I'm doing? Okay, so that gives us three regimes for this scaling for the dark matter density. So, oh, so in radiation domination, so for, sorry, dark matter annihilation rate. So in this radiation dominated epoch, matter dominated epoch and dark energy dominated epoch, so the ma so here we have um, six pa a to the minus six times a cubed times um, a squared here. So in the radiation dominated epoch, it scales like a to the minus one. In the matter dominated epoch, like a to the minus one point five, and in the dark energy dominated, epo dominated epoch, like a to the minus three. Where here we're assuming that sigma v doesn't scale with a. So now, just from knowing, so now if we know, you know, just model independently, just by knowing that at freeze out, this number has to be about one, we can estimate for thermorelic dark matter what fraction of dark matter is annihilating in a Hubble time at any other epoch in the universe's history. Yeah? Okay, good. The question is, is the assumption that sigma v is a constant a good assumption? Um, this is, yeah, this is something I will talk about shortly. It, it's the true, it's, it's at least approximately true for a lot of models. So in general, there will always be some small temperature dependent corrections to the cross section. But if you have just a short range interaction, a contact interaction, and the final state particles are relativistic, then the uh, the S wave annihilation cross section sigma scales like one over v, so sigma v is is essentially constant. It just depends on the particle physics parameters of the problem. Um, that that's so. 
in more generally, you can write it out as an expansion in V squared. It's just that you know already it frees out. The temperature of the universe is a 20th the mass of the dark matter, so already V squared is the order 10%. As the universe cools and expands further, the typical velocities drop lower. And the, and the approximation that only the first term in this expansion, which is the sigma V constant term, um, dominates, becomes a very good approximation. That said, you can have models where that first term vanishes, where there is no term in this expansion where sigma is just proportional to 1 over V and everything has a steeper velocity scaling. Then you have to, you have to redo these estimates and waste the washer. OK. But so, so what this means is that, OK, let, let's take a couple of illustrative epochs in the universe's history where we have observational handles and see what this tells us. So for example, at Big Bang nuclear synthesis, the temperature of the universe is about 1 MeV. If, um, if we were to say, so this is still during radiation domination. So this tells us that if we have thermorelic dark matter where, where this sigma v, where S wave annihilation dominates, where this sigma v is approximately constant, then so let's, let's use this as an example. We have 100 GeV dark matter. That implies that the freeze out temperature is about 5 GeV. That means that the temperature of the universe between freeze out and BBN has dropped by about five, a factor of 5 times 10 to the 3. That means that to the degree that the temperature just scales like 1 over A, <coughs> then so A to the minus 1 scales like, um, scales like T modulo injections of entropy. So this tells us by BBN about 1 dm particle in 10 to the 4 annihilates. every Hubble time. So this is long after freeze out, this is long after BBN, but still 1 in 10,000 dark matter particles, you know, and of order that much of the, energy, of the matter energy in the matter content of the universe is being converted into radiation at any given time. Now, of course, at this point, the universe is still pretty radiation dominated. It's not true that dark matter is 20% of the energy density of the universe at that point, and that dilutes things. But still, at BBN, the abundances of the, the, the abundances of the rarer and heavier elements can be 11 or 12 orders of magnitude lower than the abundance of hydrogen. So the energy injection per baryon here is, you know, of, of order, you know, I mean, there's an energy injection comparable to the mass of the baryon, in this case, for every couple of hundred baryons. So this, this energy injection can potentially perturb BBN pretty substantially. I'm mostly going to refer you to a paper here, because there's a nice review of this. And this archive paper by um, Jadamsik and Pospolov. This, this statement? Right, OK. So all I'm saying is I know that in this radiation-dominated epoch, the annihilation rate scales as 1 over A. OK? I know that 1 over A is a pro scales like the temperature of the universe. OK? So that means that the, that the degree to which my annihilation rate per unit volume per Hubble time has decreased is just exactly given by the factor by which the temperature has decreased. OK? 
And I know that I started out at this freeze out temperature. That was exactly this rate was about one. Okay? Like my, my typical. Okay. Oh, sorry, I guess rather it was like N. Yeah, sorry. My, my probability for any given dark matter particle to annihilate is about N. Okay, so. Uh, just um, uh, yeah. So I'm 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 going from um, one MeV to five GeV. It's five times ten to the three. I round it up to ten to the four. So I'm rounding logarithmically. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good. So okay. Now let, so we can go even further down. We can go down to the we can go down to the epoch of the CMB, the cosmic microwave background. We can ask, all right, so what's the temperature now? The temperature now is about 1 EV. And at the CMB, we're in the epoch with past matter radiation equality, but still almost all the time since freeze out has been in a radiation dominated phase. Matter radiation equality happens at a temperature of about 5 EV. So again, So now, let's again take 100 GeV dark matter, I'm cooling down from 5 GeV. So that means that my, my temperature has cooled by a factor of about 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10. And again, by the same estimate, most of which was in the radiation dominated epoch. So again, now we have. So now our rate of annihilation per Hubble time is about one in 10 to the 10. Okay, so okay, this seems like a pretty small number, but let's think about this for, let's think about this for a moment. Each of those dark matter annihilations here will liberate 100 GeV of energy, or 200 GeV of energy, okay? And if we have 100 GeV dark matter, and it's um, five times more abundant than the baryons by mass, that means there are about 20 baryons for every dark matter particle, okay? So if we say, okay, one in 10 to the 10 dark matter particles annihilates, each of those annihilations liberates 200 GeV of energy. So for every dark matter particle, we're getting about, um, we're getting about 20 EV of energy, okay? For every dark matter particle in the cosmos, these annihilations are giving about, if we would average out of all dark matter particles in the cosmos, get 200 GeV for each dark matter particle that annihilates, about one in 10 to the 10 annihilate. So I get about 20 EV per dark matter particle, okay? So that in turn for this mass number is about one EV per baryon. So actually the amount of power in annihilations being liberated here per baryon is comparable to the existing temperature of the thermal bath. Even though only one in 10 to the 10 dark matter particles is annihilating, there's so much energy bound up in those particles that it can have a non-negligible effect on the temperature. And furthermore, this one EV per baryon, another way to say that is for every 10 
baryons, you have about 13.6 eV of energy. That means if this power all went into ionization, this is enough to ionize 10% of the hydrogen in the universe. Just from... Just the baryons? All the baryons. So the baryons for dark matter particles, all the baryons. Right. So if I say I have 100 GeV, if I have 100... So you, you can work out how this will vary with mass as well. It becomes a stronger statement for lower masses. But yeah, if I have... So there's about five times as much dark matter by mass as there are baryons, right? A baryon's about one GeV. A dark matter particle in this, in this example that we've taken is about 100 GeV. That means that there are about 20 baryons, about 20 GeV of baryonic matter for every dark matter particle. Okay? Yeah? <coughs> I didn't know that the CMB can actually constrain the dark matter mass at all. Uh, yeah. So, like, like uh, what are constraints like? Uh, like well, no well let's, let's just, okay. yeah, I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you the actual numbers, but yeah. So what this tells us is that at this rate, like by this very hand wavy estimate that we've done, this would say that 100 GeV thermal da relic dark matter, if all the power went into ionization, you would ionize 10% of the hydrogen in the universe. That's really ruled out because we now have very strong constraints on the ionization history of the universe just after the time of last scattering because any free electrons in that period act as screens for the CMB. Now you had several lectures on the CMB earlier in this class. Oh, okay, I just wrote on that one. I know you had several lectures on the CMB earlier in this class. We have extremely precise measurements of the CMB and isotropies now. We can constrain ionite changes to the ionization history after the surface of soon after the surface of last scattering at the level of a few times 10 to the minus 4. If one hydrogen atom in a thousand is ionized at redshift 600, we would know. So, so. I'll write down here. So one EV So the comparison of these two numbers tells you that measurements of the CMB have the potential to constrain thermorelic dark matter at this scale. Now what we've done so far is pretty optimistic. It assumes that 100% of the power goes into ionization. And I've also done a bit of hand-waving about you know, ignoring the time between matter radiation equality and matter radiation domination. I've left out some factors of two here and there. But it turns out that when you do the calculation carefully and you work it out, that, this, that you can use the CMB to basically rule out S-wave thermorelic dark matter with a mass below about 10 GeV unless it annihilates 100% into neutrinos or, an, an or annihilates with a large branching fraction into neutrinos. So, and you can see, I mean, you can see the hierarchy that you're taking advantage of here is even though only a tiny fraction of the dark matter particles are annihilating, um, you don't need you only need a tiny fraction of the power in each annihilation to ionize a hydrogen atom or to heat up the universe at the level of its temperature at this time. So.
so there's a caveat on that last statement, which is that if you're annihilating completely into neutrinos, then not much of that power is going to go into ionizing hydrogen. So keep that caveat in mind. But modulo that caveat, it's, it's pretty amazing to me that we now understand the early universe well enough that you can use it to rule out one dark matter particle in 10 to the 10 annihilating at this time. Yeah? What about the Wimbledon models, which have like masses below 10 GeV, but they have uh, smaller coupling? Like, are they ruled out by this? I've never heard anybody mention these things in that context. So, the Wimplus, oh, right, so the question was, um, there are Wimplus models which have the right Fermorelli cross-section despite having a mass scale that's very different from the weak scale. The way that this is normally engineered, if I, I, I'm, now I haven't worked on these models personally, so people who have should feel free to correct me. But in those models, generally, there's a relationship between the mass scale and the coupling between the dark matter and the standard model, such that you can naturally obtain this thermorelic cross-section, this 3 times 10 to the minus 26 centimeters cubed per second, despite being at a mass scale that is not the weak scale or close to it. Um, if it's S-wave annihilation and it produces electromagnetically interacting particles, then I think it will be ruled out at mass scales below about 10 GV by these bounds. Uh, Sorry, yeah, because um, in reality the number is about 10, to, you, can constrain, um, you can constrain annihilation at the level of about uh, 1 in 10 to the 11 or 1 in 10 to the 12, but we can just, we can just remove the, this is, mostly, this is mostly a rhetorical statement, the more precise statement is that you can rule out thermorelic dark matter below about 10 GV. The rhetorical statement is just that even if you have uh, rates as small as of order 1 in 10 to the 10, then you can still say something meaningful about it. That's, that's right, unless the, yeah, so if the, right, so let me go on and say, okay, so this is, so if you have thermorelic dark matter and you make these assumptions, the dark matter was initially in thermal equilibrium, that it's annihilating into standard model particles, and that this sigma v is independent of, uh, is independent of time or independent of velocity, then you can make these statements about how dark matter annihilation can potentially affect the universe. There can be non-negligible effects on BBN. There can be non-negligible effects on the cosmic microwave background. And as we saw by the example that we did earlier, you can also get non-negligible measurable signals in present day, in present day galaxies. But what happens when you go, when you go outside those assumptions? When you move beyond this sort of standard picture of thermal, of thermal dark matter? So one of the differences, yeah, 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 okay, good, over time, okay. In that case, I will say, um, I will say some rhetorical, I, I will say some rhetorical things and then I will let you go to dinner and we will continue this, and we will continue this tomorrow. But yeah, one way in which this can be different is if instead of the annihilation being into the standard model, it's into it's into some dark sector. There are, now sometimes those dark sector particles will subsequently decay back into standard model particles, and then you have constraints on, and then you have constraints on that. If that decay is prompt, then a lot of these constraints will, will still apply because you're still essentially annihilating into standard model particles just um, at, a slightly, at a slightly later time. Now, other ways, that this can, the laundry list that this can change is, so, so, other options. Okay, so yeah, DM can annihilate entirely or partly into a dark sector. I, cut, I drew, so this can be, this could be literally just dark matter, dark matter particles, two dark matter particles annihilating into, say, dark photons. In that case, the calculation goes through largely as before, except, the, um, except you also need to take into account the thermal coupling or lack thereof of these particles to the standard model. You can have effects like semi-annihilation. 
where what you have is where you can have multiple dark matter light particles and you have an annihilation process where two dark matter particles come in, one dark matter particle walks out along with one standard model particle. You can have things like the simple models where the main process that maintains thermal equilibrium is a process where three dark matter particles produce two dark matter particles, thus depleting the dark matter abundance and heating up the dark matter on this side. You can, um, you can have cases in the general category not of thermal freeze out, you, well, you can have a case where it's not actually the dark matter that is in thermal equilibrium with the standard model, but another species is in thermal equilibrium with the standard model and freezes out and then later decays to produce the dark matter. And even if, even if we do have, so in, in all of these cases, if you want to do the kinds of calculations that we've done here, you have to go back to the Boltzmann equation, where we wrote down for the early universe, and you have to resolve the Boltzmann equation incorporating these different possible interactions between dark matter and the other species. And then there are other kinds of modifications where which is sort of closer to what we've done already, to what you've to the calcula standard calculation that you've seen, where the dark matter annihilation can be suppressed at low velocities, um, where, where, the dark, where the annihilation cross-section, rather than being velocity independent, has some additional V squared or higher dependence. If that's the case, then you will completely kill these BBN and CMB constraints, because as the universe expands, the dark matter gets colder, its velocity goes down. You can also have the opposite situation. You can have cases where the dark matter annihilation is enhanced at low velocities. The easiest way to do this is through a long-range interaction, the so-called Sommerfeld enhancement. If that happens, then the potential effects on BBN and on the CMB can become much larger, and those models are in turn much more constrained. OK, so to sum up that, that first lecture, See what I said. So, all right, for both decay and annihilation, we have scenarios that, that give us potential answers to interesting problems about dark matter and that are potentially experimentally probable in the present day. There are a huge range of very, in, in the case of annihilation, for example, it can change the thermal and ionization history of our cosmos over a huge range of times. It's not just today that you can look for dark matter annihilation signals, but also indirectly um, on its impact throughout, uh, throughout the history of our universe. At the same time, there are many variations on these scenarios, or quite different scenarios. There, there is no guarantee that this, is, that this is how dark matter behaves. So um, there's a huge range of possible signals that we can look for. We'll talk more about how we look for them, what tools we have to look for them, and how you do the analyses tomorrow and on Friday. Thanks for staying. I'll let you guys go get dinner. Yep. Uh, Hi. Hi. Berkeley. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. So I, I, I just want to comment on that. Uh, here's one more possibility that's very similar to the last one that you mentioned. That, yep. uh, we don't have kind of the dark, I mean, the turn particle freeze out. And then right. Here, yeah. Right. 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 Sure, sure. So yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. So, sorry. No, th this is.